Hello, everyone. Today is Wednesday, June 24th. Welcome to the TED Talk portion of the Hospitality Law Conferences of 2020. We're going to kick it off today with six very succinct, cogent programs that will last about eight minutes each. They will uh, give you the strong uh, overview of their uh, perspectives about what's going on in their space. And then don't forget uh, this coming Tuesday uh, on the live portion of the program, they will be taking a deeper dive into their area for about 20 minutes where you can ask questions. So to kick us off, we've got J. Michael Coleman, shareholder at Hagwood in Tipton. Mike has been trying cases for over 20 years. He's vice president of the Mississippi Defense Lawyers Association. And a little known fact is he's an elite dirt bike racer. He's going to talk to us about that lizard theory that's out there and surviving those jury trials. Take it away, Mike Coleman. Well, thank you. I, I would uh, quibble with one word you used. You said elite, and we're going to talk today some, a good bit about wordplay and how words matter, especially when you're dealing with the reptile theory. And I am not an elite dirt bike racer, but I am an, <laughs> a, a dirt bike racer, and I'll provide you with some more proof about that a little later. Uh, but yes, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, sort of lizard proofing your witnesses under this reptile theory. And I hope at this point, you know, I'm not talking about this kind of reptile. I'm talking about these lizards here. This is the group that developed this reptile theory that's used to scare witnesses and scare jurors into uh, awarding larger uh, verdicts than they should, perhaps not giving a defense law verdict when they should. Uh, and I just wanted to cut to the brass tacks. I only have eight minutes. So uh, what I do here is I teach my witnesses, and these will be your employees. If you're a general counsel or if you're a risk manager, you want to get with your defense counsel and have a plan for for dealing with this rather sleazy way of conning people. And the first thing to do is teach them that it, it is a con game. This is a game that can be played uh, and they can play it well. Most people in their regular lives have been conned by one person or another and no one likes it. So this will be something that's familiar to them, but they're not expecting to get hit with a con game during a deposition. So my experience is if you teach them what's going on and give them a little credit, they'll play the game pretty well. One of the things I like to do to help them in this situation is give, and, and this word safe space has kind of taken on some political correctness connotations, but uh, long before the word safe space was out there, I was using this word with my witnesses to describe a blurb or a safe answer that's consistent with your theme in the case. Uh, and this is, you've seen this when uh, politicians or anybody that's interviewed on a regular basis, they'll often not necessarily answer the question Instead, they'll provide a very safe uh, pre-planned response. For example, in a, in a premises liability case where you're talking about lack of security measures, and that's the, the theme of the case is, hey, we did what we could, but we, you know, even the cops couldn't keep this place safe, then that can become the safe place and they can answer the question like this. Look, I don't really understand your question. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. All I can tell you is we took reasonable precautions to make our premises safe, but not even police officers can do that. No one can make it 100% safe. So we did what was reasonable. You give them a, a canned answer like that and it needs to be in their own words um, because what you're dealing with here are strict uh, safety rules that are formulated or even fabricated by plaintiff's counsel. And you wanna give your witness some wiggle room so that when you, you, instead of it being a black and white issue, you can identify the gray areas in. So in other words, uh, Reptile only works if it's black and white. So you want to teach, and so it's, they use words like never and always. You can never violate this safety rule. It's always important that guest safety is the number one issue. And so you want to identify gray areas and teach your witnesses wordplay so that they can identify these, these solid words like never, always, and replace them with it depends, or well, that depends on the situation, or, or some rules have to be flexible. You can teach them to play these, these, uh, word games back with the plaintiff's attorney and take out those harsh uh, concrete black and white words and substitute them with uh, more flexible words in the gray areas. Uh, the next slide I, I put up here was, was this uh, set of pin, uh, pins. 
and I'll, I'll just show you. I use those pins um, to teach my witnesses this wordplay. This pen here actually has red ink in it, and this pen here, this pen here has blue ink in it. And I'll pull these out and I'll tell the witness, let's pretend we're in a lawsuit where penmanship and writing and ink matters. Could you please identify for the record the red pen? And every one of them always picks this pen. Now this pen has got red on it, but as you can see, it's also got a bunch of clear on it. And we know now, but the witness doesn't know that that ink in there is blue. So I, I point this out to say, if you teach your, your witnesses to dissect the questions like this, what is the red pen? What do you mean by that? That pen is not entirely red. I don't know anything about the ink in that pen, things of that mat and of that nature. They'll learn the wordplay. They'll learn how to dissect questions in a deposition and they won't fall for these words like never always, or these safety, these rigid safety rules. Now, when I talk about identifying the triggers, I'm, uh, the reptile theory relies on safety rules that you may have in place or fabricated safety rules that don't actually exist. And you want to identify those before the deposition so that your witness is ready to respond to them. Now, they know their uh, business better than you do. Even if you're the in-house counsel or a risk manager, the maintenance man that, that might be testifying knows his job, the daily ins and outs of his job better than you do. And so you need to let them identify these, these possible safety rules that are going to be either made up or that may be existent in your uh, policies and procedures or things of that nature. The witnesses don't know the law, so it's important to explain just the basic premise of uh, uh, the elements of a premises liability uh, case so that they can, hey, oh, well, if, if I know that, then the safety rule is likely to be X, Y, or Z. And then you can go back and uh, identify the triggers with them. After you've taught them a little bit about the law, you can come up with what the safety rules are, are likely to be either harped on by plaintiff's counsel or are absolutely fabricated by plaintiff's counsel. And then, of course, you're going to know the, the ins and outs of the case from a mile high view a little bit better than these on the ground witnesses. So you'll want to go back and fill in any holes and sort of modify the, the safety rules and how you're going to deal with them uh, in the meantime. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm a dirt bike racer. I just want to prove that to y'all. That's an actual picture of me racing my dirt bike. Uh, I, I do hair scrambles and enduros and my son and I do it together. It has absolutely nothing to do with reptile, but I wanted to prove and at least develop some credibility with you that I am who I say I am. <laughs> the next brass tack thing that, that I want to uh, uh, tell y'all about is you need to actually practice and, and film it. And there's a tendency for some reason, I think with depositions to sort of hurry through the prep part when there's trial on the horizon, everybody's scared to death. And so everybody preps uh, usually adequately enough, but oftentimes we'll want to just show up a couple of hours beforehand, meet with the witness, give them a few tips on, on how to take a deposition and then roll the dice. You can't do that in reptile cases. You need to prepare an actual reptile mock deposition and you need to practice that with your witness. And then we all have a pretty good camera in our pocket these days, video camera. If you don't have one, uh, most of your laptops have, you know, uh, web cameras and things like that, but you should film this because if a picture is worth a thousand words and a video is worth a million and nothing helps your witness learn by them watching himself flounder around trying to answer these questions. The next thing I say from a brass tax point of view is I've found it's better to let these witnesses correct their own failures, watch the video with them. They will see themselves floundering and instead of telling them or preaching at them about how to do it better next time, ask them questions like, how do you think you could have done that better? Or knowing what you now know about reptile, what can we tweak on this answer to make it come off a little bit better? Uh, as you know, your, your witnesses are often very similar to your jurors and, and when they get that where they are comfortable with their response, usually the jurors will be too. Um, you want to help them fill in the holes because like I said, they're going to know their job. They're going to know uh, now a little bit about the reptile theory, but you're going to have a more of a, a bird's eye view of the entire case. So there may be certain things that need to be, uh, you know, uh, refined or, or harped on a little bit more than what they're, what they're thinking. But in large part, if you'll let them identify the triggers, let them correct their own mistakes, they will become invested in the process and more importantly, they'll learn how to think on their on the fly in dealing with these kind of questions. I had a coach in high school who was famous for yelling at the top of his lungs, famous for yelling at the top of his lungs. And uh, I'm sure all of you had that experience if you participated in any kind of sports. There's no excuse uh, for not doing this a couple of times. Your iPhone uh, film in your iPhone is free. You don't have to get it developed. You can just do it over and over again until the witness gets it right. And I think that if you do that, your witness will not look like this guy here 
uh, and will not trigger these sort of reptile feelings if they actually exist. There's a whole question of science about whether this reptile theory is a bunch of bunk anyway. Uh, but it has seemed to be pretty successful at raising the value of some cases and, and, and getting some plaintiff's oriented uh, verdicts rather than defense or, or oriented verdicts. And so whether the science is, is uh, whether that's actual causation or whether that's just uh, because the technique works on other levels, we don't know. But you don't want your witnesses to look like this guy. You want them to look more like Mar Marissa Tomei and my cousin Benny. And you want to be as smooth as Benny was there at the end with your witnesses at trial and in deposition. I think if you'll follow these, these uh, sort of brass tacks guidelines and study up on the reptile theory, uh, you can have a witness like Marissa and uh, everything will go well. I hope this has been helpful. And uh, I'm obviously going to be looking forward to the questions in the deep dive session. Thank you very much, Mike. That's a great way to kick us off. Great information. Sounds like you and your partners over there have the foundation for a book. So uh, I, I hope you'll continue that. That's great ideas in the witness prep space. Thank you so much. Well, looking ahead, now we want to talk about some reopening concepts. And to start us off in that space, we have Andrea Ryan, partner with Fisher and Phillips. Andrea is a labor and employment lawyer that specializes in employment defense and has been doing so since 1988. She co-chairs the Hospitality Business Practice Group for F&P, and she's a member of their COVID-19 task force. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear what Andrea Ryan has to say about reopening. Thank you, Stephen. I am actually quite happy to be discussing this topic. Most people wouldn't say that about a worldwide pandemic. But for the last three months, we've been talking about laying people off, furloughing people, PPP loans, unemployment compensation. And so it's nice to be able to turn this topic to back towards bringing our, our employees back to work. But there are some challenges. Um, I, I know the industry has weathered a lot of challenges in the past from terrorism and um, major weather events and hurricanes and tornadoes. I don't know that the industry worldwide has dealt with a, a pandemic a worldwide virus pandemic, but we're learning. Um, and, and just like the industry is learning, so are we as, as labor and employment lawyers. My, my first and best advice to you, and what I'm prepared to talk to you about, is have a restart plan in place. Uh, even if you've opened, even if you've partially opened, even if you think you've fully opened. I'm working with a lot of clients who just seem to be floundering a little bit in, in, in terms of what that plan is. Number one piece of advice, do not open, do not book a piece of business that is in violation of your local or state shutdown or reopening orders. Um, it, it sends a signal to your employees that you don't care about them, that you don't care about your guests, that, that you're willing to bend the rules. So become an expert in those shutdown or reopening orders, even as they change or designate somebody to become an expert. Every department needs some sort of written return to work plan and, it, and you need to be prepared to modify it, obviously. Some departments, it will be easier than others as we start looking at you know, social distancing, um, housekeeping, security, front desk, those are easy to kind of look at a spatial, at the space and make those adjustments. Other departments, not so much. If you think about culinary and food and beverage, it would be much more difficult to, to, to put that plan in place with your normal work processes. So I think it's critical that you, you challenge each department leader to sit down and figure out new ways of perhaps food preparation, food service, uh, guest service, that will allow them to socially distance. We know, and I know you know, that your guests are doing what you can to keep your employees and guests safe, and your guests are expecting it as well, although they're not as compliant as we certainly would like them to be. I'm sure you're seeing that as well. Um, as you'll see from this slide, you know, I certainly want to talk to you about what your legal obligations are with regard to providing PPE, hazard communication, temperature taking, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment on the next slide. But you, OSHA has a general duty clause that requires you to provide a safe working place for your employees. And so if challenged, we need to be in a position to say that we have you know, taken all the appropriate steps from the minute they walk in the door, whether we're taking their temperature or doing a health assessment risk to the time they leave, and, and all the cleaning protocols in between. On the issue of taking temperatures, which I deal with on the next slide, 
I, I do want to talk to you during our, our breakout sessions in depth. You know, what, what's required by your local or state uh, uh, orders, reopening orders. How, if you're going to do temperature checks, um, how, how often you do them, how you do them, does the employee do them themselves? Do you have a, a leader, manager taking temperatures and recording them, and are they properly protected? When they're doing that, are you paying employees if there's a significant delay by the time? Are they clocked in or clocked out when you're, when you're doing temperature checks? So we'll dig into that a little bit as well. As I mentioned earlier, this issue of social distancing in, in a hotel or a restaurant is easier said than done. Um, you need to look at every facility as an assembly line and determine with, within your um, property location in each department, in your public areas, and your employee only areas, what you can do to maximize social distancing. Again, your guests expect this, even if they don't comply with it all the time, but, but concentrate on two areas. Um, most of the properties that I've been in, in the last two weeks, I've been on a, a lengthy vacation, lucky me, um, the public areas were very well marked, but I don't know what's going on behind the scenes in your, in your um, employee only areas. So be cautious about what you're doing in restrooms, locker rooms, employee break rooms, and other areas where employee other areas where employees congregate. Something that has really come to the forefront during this pandemic is workplace privacy issues, especially with regard to medical information. I want to remind you all that your obligation to keep medical information confidential comes under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is not a HIPAA uh, issue unless you happen to be a, a medical provider or an insurer. So your obligation arises under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that's with regard to all of the information you get, whether it's antibody tests, positive COVID tests, negative COVID tests, results, um, uh, underlying health conditions that an employee reports to you that may require you to modify how you return to the work or if you return them to work. And there are some states with very strict requirements in terms of, of authorization to maintain health information and, um, and, and how, you, how you maintain it, how to get it and how you maintain it. So we want to make sure we're uh, being um, strictly compliant with all the state laws as well. Let me talk a little bit about your managers and supervisors. And I think it's critically important that if you're implementing new policies and protocols, which you should be, your new safety, COVID-related safety and security policies are new policies and protocols. They may not need them uh, in the long-term future, but right now they're, they, your management team need to be trained in advance on what the policies require, and you need to make sure they, they are enforcing them. The number of of clients called me recently and say they have employees that are figuring out ways to go around the temperature taking. They're reporting, you know, to remote location. They're reporting directly to the spa or reporting directly to a to a golf course um, work area instead of going through HR and having their temperature taken. And so um, th this is a strict safety protocol that needs to be managed that way. I think it's also important that your managers and supervisors are in a position to share information with your employees, information impacting business what the future looks like, what the near-term and long-term future looks like in terms of your booking. Um, your employees are your, are, are your biggest asset. Keeping them safe, keeping them well-informed about where you're going and wh where you are moving forward, when some of their colleagues will be able to return to work, it is going to be really important for employee morale. And then, of course, you've got your human resources function. Um, I'm happy to talk in depth about sort of the difference between furloughed and laid-off employees, what, what you need to do if you're recalling employees versus rehiring employees. Do you, know, do you redo paperwork? Do you redo I-9 forms? We can talk a little bit in depth about that. Uh, I recently gave a, an interview to a, a major paper and they said, what's your best advice about recalling employees? I said, do what you said you were going to do when you put them out on furlough and layoff. Think back, what did we tell them? Did we give them specific information about how we were bringing them back? And if you did, stick with your word. Whether that's a security, a seniority-based return, whether that's first in, first out, whatever a method, or, or just purely based on operational needs and skill sets. Comply with what you said. And I know you all want to talk about the challenge of returning employees who are getting pretty darn comfortable collecting unemployment. And I'm happy to talk about that. I'm, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to coax some folks back, um, what we're going to say to the Department of Labor if we offer 
offer work and they don't take it, and how to deal with employees who are reluctant, some for very good reasons, medical reasons, for example, child care reasons, or just simply fear. And so we can talk about some options in communicating with your employee. Whether you're going to do background checks and drug testing, um, I'm happy to, you know, talk a little bit of in depth about some really practical issues and, and practical solutions. One thing to remember is when Congress passed the Families First Response Act, this law for those of you in with under 500 employees, and even those of you who may not be subject to the regular Family and Medical Leave Act, are subject to the Family First Response Act requiring emergency paid sick leave and emergency FMLA. So both are in effect till the end of this year. And so even returning employees may be eligible for this benefit if something happens. I will tell you the most common theme we're seeing is someone returns to work and, and they get sick with a, a, a case of COVID um, and, and, their, and their coworkers may or may not become infected. And of course, this, the benefits under this law uh, come into effect as well. And so I, I'm happy to talk to you all about how to document that to maximize your ability to get all the tax credits that are available to you. And of course, last but not least, we always have the wage and hour compliance. I uh, want to make sure that we're complying with, with state laws. Uh, a lot of folks have paid hazard pay. It's not my favorite word because I, I sure hate to, to indicate to our employees that, that they're, in a, they're working in a hazardous situation, but um, a term of art. And you know, when, when can you stop paying that pay? When should you? Uh, maybe, maybe you shouldn't. So we'll talk a little bit about how to make that. Anyone who made pay adjustments. Uh, downward during this crisis or, or moved people from exempt status to non-exempt status. It's important that we carefully discuss how you're going to return them to their previous um, position or previous pay status. So lots of issues, uh, but again, I'm happy that we're, we are talking about uh, returning to work because uh, I'm happy to see that the industry is starting to bounce back. So I look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was very helpful. And, and the deeper dive is, is going to be intense. I, I saw this morning where Virginia has try, is trying to step in where they think there's a void from OSHA enforcement. So I'm sure that'll come up in your deeper dive around state enforcement policies as well. But thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk now about a couple of different areas. Uh, price gouging, number one, which is an issue that we really need to keep at the forefront. And number two, uh, data security as we begin to reopen. And fortunately, we have one lawyer that can handle both of those items. Mr. Sandy Garfinkel is a member of the Eckert Siemens Law Firm. He's chair of their data security and privacy practice group. Sandy's been focusing on the hospitality industry for over 20 years, and he, he helps clients develop policies, but also uh, assists them in regulatory compliance and investigations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sandy Garfinkel. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I do have two rather large topics to cover in the space of uh, one period of presentation. So I'm going to probably go real fast and we'll pick up questions and details when we get to the deeper dive. But let's start with price gouging. As Stephen said, um, we do need to keep an eye on this right now. You know, it seems rather weird to be talking about price gouging right now. It's not something in the news. Um, but it will be, and, uh, and I think um, hotels and uh, hospitality businesses in general are particularly vulnerable um, to price gouging claims. Here's the situation. What is price gouging? Um, when a business provides essential consumer goods or services, that includes lodging, and then takes advantage of abnormal market conditions uh, caused by events such as natural disasters, uh, disease, let's say, uh, armed conflict, uh, other things, um, and they base their pricing on the abnormal market conditions and overcharge. Um, that is a violation of state law in a number of states. We'll go to the next slide. So price gouging is based on state law. Um, it is regulated generally by attorneys general or consumer protection agencies, and you are subject to civil and criminal penalties if you're found in violation of these laws. Right now, 35 U.S. states have 
anti-price gouging laws. They are similar, but not the same in every state. And that's important to note uh, because wherever your hotel or restaurant is situated, that's the law you're gonna have to comply with and they uh, aren't all the same. So how do these work? Um, you gotta keep an eye on your pricing. And um, if you charge excessive prices during a declared state of emergency, that's generally the trigger uh, for when price gouging laws apply. Now take a minute and think about where we are in the world right now. Um, I'll, I think I say this on a, uh, a slide in, the, in a minute, but we have more states of emergency right now than have over the past several months in this country than the country has ever seen at one time. And they can, they can be and have been declared at every level of government. So in addition to all the other things that a state of emergency means, it also triggers the application of price gouging laws and limitations on increase in pricing. Um, and so uh, they usually stay in effect for the length of the state of emergency. They can be extended uh, and states of emergency can be extended. And so in addition to knowing when a state of emergency is declared, you have to know how long it's gonna last and whether it's been extended by further executive order. So um, we have more states of emergency going on in the past several months than we've ever had. Most of them are still going on. Uh, in my state, there's litigation between the legislature and the governor about whether to continue the state of emergency. Um, but also, if you uh, look at the news this morning, you can see there are a number of places uh, that um, are in, uh, experiencing surges in COVID-19 diagnoses and death numbers. Uh, and there's talk of uh, re-shutdowns, uh, reinstituting shutdowns and other limitations. And so um, these states of emergency are in states of flux um, and some, some uh, some states have them in effect, some counties have them in effect, uh, some of them have been struck down, some of them have been discontinued, many of them have been coming back. So you're sort of in, in a, uh, a storm of states of emergency and you, you're, as a business you've got to keep an eye on whether they're in effect or not at the time. So if you get hit with a price gouging claim, uh, invest, it starts with an investigation. Investigations usually by the attorney general. They'll send you uh, lists of requests for written information. There's a whole uh, slew of information they're going to want from you that 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 prove uh, what your pricing is, what it was right before the state of emergency was declared, and what it was after the state of emergency. And they use that generally. The model is if there's a 10% increase between the before and after, you're in the danger zone for violating price gouging laws. Uh, and so part of the way that affects hotels is hotels have automated rate setting systems, a lot of them, where they look at uh, your comp set, they look at demand, um, and, um, and sometimes the rates move on their own without a person's physical finger on the button uh, changing the rates. And so you can get into trouble that way if your rate is reacting to a, a abnormal market conditions and suddenly shoots up um, and you may not even realize it before there's uh, some complaint filed with the attorney general by a guest um, who's disgruntled. So, so how do we plan for this? Uh, we know price gouging laws exist. You know where your hotel or restaurant is located. Um, you, you find out whether there's a law, um, in a price gouging law in the venue where your, uh, where your facility is located. You learn what the law says generally and you create a standard uh, electronic written form uh, or written form that you can send to the key person who's got their finger on the button of rate setting or price setting. Um, so as soon as a state of emergency is declared where your hotel or restaurant is situated, somebody should be sending somebody else a message saying, hey, we have a state of emergency here. We need to keep an eye on pricing now. Um, and as I mentioned before, in hotel situation, there's a lot of automation in the price setting that has to be um, uh, tempered when the state of emergency is declared. Somebody's got to shut that off and be on manual pricing until the state of emergency is over 
Lastly, you want to document everything just in case an investigation starts. I can tell you I've, I've got one in litigation in Louisiana for a hotel that started in 2016 and is still going and is nowhere near trial. Um, so hotels you want you, and restaurants, you really want to avoid getting into price gouging trouble. And right now with all the states of emergency going on, you need to be extra careful about what your rates and prices are as you're reopening. So quickly, let's talk about data security and privacy issues as it relates to reopening. Um, so uh, if your business uh, is typical, uh, you're, when you sent everybody home, there was a rush uh, to implement remote capabilities so that your employees could continue to work. Um, so you may be, have been using existing technology. You may have had to purchase and implement new technology um, and, and, and rush it into use. Um, and what falls by the wayside in that kind of environment um, are making sure you have proper policies concerning use and safe uh, practices, uh, training on the same topics, um, testing of the systems to make sure they're secure. Um, and you have to keep in mind that everybody's now working from an uncontrolled home environment. Uh, and, and it takes um, a special knowledge to make sure, a special awareness to make sure um, when you have paper or screens with sensitive information up on them, that nobody who's not supposed to see them is walking around and looking at them. So, so these are the types of technologies we saw being rushed into implementation when we went home. We're using some of them right now. Video conferencing, file sharing, virtual desktops, group chat, VPN, and web-based application and tools. I'm sure, uh, we, you know, in every business, to some extent, some of these tools are being, were being used and continue to be used uh, while people are still working remotely and even as they're starting to return to work. Some of these types of technologies are known to be vehicles that data thieves use to intrude into a system. Virtual desktops uh, is one that has been very popular lately for um, scammers and thieves to sneak into somebody's system and implant malware that does other things. And so that creates a situation now where we're, you know, we're increasing the use of this by people who aren't used to it and maybe systems that aren't tested that well for security. So it's creating a lot of opportunities um, for bad things to happen. And we are seeing uh, a huge increase in types of cybercrime right now since the crisis started. Um, there's been a tremendous uptick in social engineering scams and social engineering uh, is just uh, basically play acting and convincing somebody uh, that you are somebody that you're not, uh, that you need information that you don't. Uh, and and uh, when people are panicked, when people are afraid, they're particularly susceptible to certain kinds of social engineering attacks, especially if the bad actor is pretending to be somebody that has information about the disease, a cure, uh, you know, uh, taking uh, 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 emergency information or purporting to and so uh, social engineering attacks are really on the rise. We're seeing a lot of business email compromise uh, cases that may be from the use of technology that we're not used to um, and maybe uh, uh, not necessarily taking care of remote logging credentials. Um, and so we're seeing a rise in business emails getting intruded into uh, regular hacking and traditional malware that is also on the rise and ransomware uh, is not only being used more frequently, it's mutating into uh, more sort of malicious and dangerous types of ransomware where they don't just lock your information away from you, uh, but they take some of it and threaten to post it uh, on the web or the dark web um, if you don't pay up. And so we're, we're really seeing an increase in all of these types of things. As I said, that the, the cyber criminals are not shy about taking advantage of the crisis and some of the most uh, mean-spirited, um, uh, you know, sociopathic scams are emerging in the midst of this crisis. You know, they will, there have been ripoffs of the uh, PPP program, um, unemployment comp fraud. There's a, a Nigerian group reportedly from the FBI 
uh, that is, has done millions of dollars worth of unemployment fraud, uh, comp fraud across the country. Um, you get a lot of uh, uh, fake communications from people pretending to be somebody they're not with information that's important to you, supposedly about COVID treatment, testing, getting more information, et cetera. So data security and privacy um, are at risk when you're returning to work, not just when you're remote. Um, you're gonna have a period of transition here. And I think most businesses are in this where some people are still working remotely while others, others may be returning to the website. You know, there's partial reopenings with limitations on the amount of uh, employees that can be on a work site. People are transporting data back and forth, maybe in media that aren't necessarily the safest. They can be lost. Uh, they can be uh, uh, compromised. Uh, people are rusty about their cyber training uh, because they haven't necessarily had it or they're working with systems that they aren't familiar with. Um, and over the past several months with all this activity, uh, wrongdoers have had a chance to sort of stockpile things that they've done like stolen login credentials and malware that they've inserted but haven't activated yet. And so, you know, the, the industry is predicting there's going to be an uptick, more of an uptick uh, in incidents as the reopening continues. So uh, we are also on the verge of a critical date on the California Consumer Privacy Act that has been uh, in effect since January 1st of this year, but July 1st, right around the corner, is when the Attorney General will begin enforcing this law. Um, and it affects companies that do business in California, meet a couple of other thresholds, and if they collect personal information from California residents, there's a whole slew of obligations uh, that now come with California Consumer Privacy Act. It is somewhat similar to Europe's GDPR, but it also has some very key differences uh, about disclosures, consumer rights, uh, and do not sell uh, over information. Um, so next slide, please. And so this is an example where CCPA could um, have a collision with reopening. Um, Andrea mentioned uh, taking temperatures and we've uh, talked to a lot of hotel clients that are planning to uh, do temperature scans at the entrance to their businesses. And this doesn't just apply to employees, it would apply to customers as well. Um, under the CCPA, uh, biometric data is protected data, and they specifically describe thermal data as biometric data. Um, and so, um, you know, if you have California customers and you're doing business in California, you need to be concerned about what you're doing with the information you collect from those temperature scans and whether you've made the proper disclosures before you've taken those temperatures and collected that information. Uh, several other states have biometric privacy laws too. Um, so, I think that's it for me. I look forward to answering questions during the deeper dive. Sandy, thank you very much. Just want to add, you know, a lot of people, uh, hoteliers, they don't recall the rack rate statutes that still exist in many states. And if they exceed that, there could also be some potential for evidence, evidence of price gouging if in fact the state of emergency is in place, as you mentioned. It's gonna be very interesting. And then you just scared the bejesus out of me with cybersecurity. So uh, I'm looking forward to your deeper dive. As always, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn now to a, an issue that is really been turned upside down through this virus, this pandemic, and that's the uh, hotel management contract space. And joining us is the guru in that space, Mr. Cliff Risman of Foley and Lardner. Cliff is the partner and co-chair of the hospitality industry team for Foley and Lardner. He's been practicing law for many years and he focuses on real estate, but he's real narrowing his scope is around developing, owning, operating, and financing hotels and resorts in a global space. He's, he's developed deals all around the world. We're very fortunate to have him. Cliff, what's going on in the hotel management space? And we need to get your, your uh, image up there. 
Thank you, Stephen. Um, guru, that's 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 a tough description to live up to, but I'll do my best. So <laughs> eight minutes, I'll go very quick. We can cover uh, any or all of these issues in more detail uh, later on. If we go the first slide, please. When when talking about what's going on in the management space, the first thing I always like to mention to people is making sure everybody understands the structure of the deal or the potential deal that's being discussed. Obviously, there's options between management contracts and leases. In the simplest form, a management contract is where the third party, the manager, receives some combination of fee, whether it be base, base plus incentive, and the balance of the net results of operations belong to the owner of the asset. The lease context is, is almost the reverse, where the operator comes in and leases the facility, pays an agreed rent to the owner of the facility, which might be base, percentage, some other add-ons, and the operator, the, 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 the benefit or burden of results of operations in order to the operator in that case, rather than the owner. Next slide, if you would, please. Um, this is particularly important now when, when I've given this presentation before, we, I normally spend a moment talking about the different ways that managers or operators can win a deal. And typically we talk about some investment by managers or operators, whether it be key money, which is in essence a one-time payment in exchange for the management contract that amortizes or burns off such that if the manager receives the full benefit of the term of the contract, the obligation to repay the key money is fully waived. You see managers making equity investments, uh, putting MES debt in place, agreeing to guarantee certain performance or to uh, reimburse the owner if certain deficits are incurred. This is more important in the current environment than ever because so many owners are cash challenged at the moment. There's a tremendous cash crunch. They've either been closed and are just reopening or have been operating at perhaps even single digit op occupancy while ownership expenses, uh, mortgage, taxes, insurance have continued to be payable. And so I think a lot of people that are looking to change managers today or in the near term are looking to a manager that will bring some investment to the table and, and put some cash into the asset. Next slide, if you would, please. Um, also, we normally talk about the alignment of, of the relationship. And look, Everybody knows that base fees come off the top. The manager oftentimes receives a percentage of gross revenue, whether the owner is earning a profit or not, whereas incentive fees um, can be more easily aligned with profitability. Normally, they take the form of a percentage of either gross operating profit or EBITDA less reserve, which is essentially NOI or profitability, maybe it's NOI over a certain hurdle, which is a return to the owner. I think you will see a move, the pendulum will move more toward the alignment of risks and rewards, more toward higher incentives and lower base fees now that people have experienced some of the, the downside of the last several months. Next slide, if you would, please. Um, another uh, very, very important issue in a downturn is termination. And I don't want to, you know, we can get into details about agency and powers to terminate versus rights to terminate when we speak later. But performance termination clauses, which generally measure sometimes one, sometimes two years, and sometimes look at a cash test and also perhaps a, a RevPAR test where you're compared to your competitive set. You know, a lot of assets that were on the edge of failing these tests may not pass them this year, next year, depending how and when things pick up. Now, these tests oftentimes have 
force majeure provisions that may or may not come into play, and that's a whole nother discussion, obviously. Um, and we can talk more about that later. Next slide, if you would, please. Um, when we talk about financing, particularly in a downturn, subordination and recognition arrangements become very critical. When assets are foreclosed, when they change hands, when they go back to lenders, has the lender recognized the manager and agreed to leave them in place becomes a key issue. Uh, a lot of cash traps and lock boxes are being triggered. They're normally triggered when performance falls below a certain level, whether it's tied to budget or set hard dollar amounts. There are a lot of folks that had soft lock boxes in place that are now finding their cash being diverted to lock boxes. There are so many cash related issues to as a result of of COVID and the pandemic, you know, folks are deferring capital expenditures, mostly with the consent of the brands and the operators, because to date, everybody's basically been playing nice in the sandbox. Brand standards are being waived. But on the other end, new cleanliness standards are being put in place, and there are incremental costs of buying those cleaning supplies, training training the staff in, in what needs to be done. Um, you know, cash, the old, the old saying, cash is king, will never more so than in the hospitality industry today. Next slide, please. Um, this, you know, employment issues, um, the big issues that have come up in the context of COVID specifically, worn issues of, as assets have been closed, people have been laid off and furloughed. Um, you know, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about work rules and some <clears throat> uh, cities that have passed statutes limiting work rules, the number of rooms that, that a housekeeper can clean in the course of a day, et cetera. I think you will see even more of that as we come out of the pandemic. Next slide, if you would, please. Um, we can talk about this later. Sandy, Sandy mentioned what's coming up in California next month. Um, I don't think there's anything we need to go into in detail here. Next slide, if you would, please. The issue of human contact and minimizing human contact, I think you will see more and more of whether it's mobile check-in. Well, the, my eight minutes are up. Let me finish real quick whether it's mobile check-in, whether it is your room not being cleaned every morning or the bed being made during your stay, efforts to avoid human-to-human -human contact. Um, time is up, so uh, I will in, I'll just let you all know that we can talk about any or all of this in more detail, or I'll be available to answer questions. And thank you again, Stephen, for the opportunity to participate today. Stephen, are you still with us? Thank you, yes. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, I need to follow my own guidelines. Uh, Cliff, that was terrific. Clearly the guru in the space. Thank you very much for that. Your deeper dive is going to be very intense as usual, particularly when you get into those agency and employees and now the data issues. It's, it's just crazy what's going on out there. So let's shift gears now, ladies and gentlemen, and let's look at uh, restaurants again and about reopening those. Joining us today is Mr. Alden Parker, uh, Sacramento Regional Managing Partner for the law firm of Fisher & Phillips, and he co-chairs the Fisher & Phillips Hospitality Industry Group and is a member of the COVID-19 Task Force. Uh, Alden in his practice counsels employers to assist them in avoiding litigation in all aspects of the employment realm and practicing in California. He gets a lot of practice, pun intended. 
Alden, tell us what's going on and what you think we need to be thinking about. And we need to get your image up on the screen. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and, and what I'm going to do here with my uh, seven minutes and the deeper dive, you know, I, I put up the title here, a grand reopening for restaurants and bringing them back. But I think it's better said in a question. You know, a, a grand reopening is really how I'm going to tackle this topic. And I'm going to come at it from a standpoint a little bit differently than Andrea, uh, who earlier went ahead and talked about a lot of the rules, a lot of the issues that are facing I'm gonna talk about the risk and some of the litigation that we're already seeing spawning out of uh, COVID-19 and shutdown orders and different requirements. And I've put a continuum up here about where we are, talking about the relief that we all went ahead and sought, uh, the restart phase that we're in, uh, recovering, reimagining, and that reimagining really encompasses the, the R that I'm gonna talk about, it's the fifth R, and that's the risk. Uh, restaurants are very good at opening, at showing a lot of care, a lot of welcoming to their customers. And that's a skill that lawyers don't have. I'll tell you a story where I, I wrote a really scary, wear your mask, uh, enter at your own risk, uh, notice that everybody that I offer to clients about going ahead and putting up at the entrance of your restaurant. And the feedback I got was, this is great, but no one's gonna wanna come and visit us anymore. And the soft touch of the entrepreneur, of the operator was really brought to bear to reimagine what compliance with the rules looks like while still creating a welcoming atmosphere. Complying with these state-by-state -state, uh, guides for reopening is incredibly difficult. And each one is going to spawn a different look at what litigation ends up looking like. So if we could go to the next slide, please. All of the different areas that we're dealing with with reopening are going to cause their own unique set of potential liability and risk for everybody. I don't know if we'll ever get back to this image where we have a, a very bustling area full of patrons. But when you have a situation where you've got local requirements for six feet of distance or, and occupancy requirements, a failure to heed to those is going to go ahead and create potential liability to your customers. Uh, you could have potential situations where an employee contracts COVID-19 and it will cause or trigger workers' compensation obligations. Those risks will be delving into deeper during my, uh, during my longer period of time but it's these types of issues that are gonna constantly go ahead and come into conflict. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Certainly masks are a big area of concern. We've seen some litigation already having to do with masks. There was an operator in uh, Texas who had an employee uh, that wanted to wear a mask and the restaurant was telling its employees that uh, they're not gonna have the employees wear a mask. The complaint over the safety aspect of uh, mask wearing or face covering uh, wearing caused that person to already file a retaliation complaint uh, where they say they felt ostracized or their shifts were cut uh, because they wanted to go ahead and follow some safety directive, whether it's a CDC rule, a state rule, or a county rule. And all of those things are coming into conflict right now, and we're seeing a lot of litigation. We're tracking this not surprisingly, of the COVID litigation that's being filed. Last count is about 240 lawsuits that were COVID specific that we've been tracking. Not surprisingly, the bulk of those are California, where most of the uh, bad employment laws uh, are dreamed up of and spread like a virus, a different type of virus across the nation. You've got Florida and New Jersey, and those three seem to be leading the pack right now in terms of different litigation we'll talk about more specifically during the deep dive. So if we could have the next slide here. Temperature checks are causing a, an interesting concern about wage and hour compliance uh, for a lot of operators. And this litigation concern that the temperature checks or the health screening, where a local order says it has to be done before they enter the premises. A lot of us have our timekeeping or payroll systems inside the premises. And so there becomes a question about how to deal effectively with capturing that time where they're subject to our control in a line, filling out our forms, us meeting some local requirement. How are we going to capture that paid time? 
And so temperature checks are an area which have not shown up yet on the national stage, but we're anticipating the health screening and the temperature checks are going to cause quite a bit of uh, wage and hour litigation that we're going to be facing. I'll be talking about that more in the future as well during the deep dive. Next slide, please. Some jurisdictions, notably uh, Tennessee, are requiring customer health screening. And uh, this is where your customers, before entering your facility during certain periods of time as we've marched toward reopening, are actually being required to fill out their own. Uh, this is a, a delicate issue for a lot of people. Obviously, there's privacy concerns that people are worried about. And the litigation that we're anticipating coming out of this will be about maintaining the privacy of that information that ends up getting handed over to you by your customers. Uh, they're going to feel insecure about it. They're going to feel concerned about handing over that information. And whether you're maintaining it properly or not will become a subject that we'll have to watch later on. So far, it's not an area that we see actual litigation coming about, uh, but it's certainly an area we think is going to come up in the future. Next slide, please. A lot of the regulations uh, and general guidance out there uh, still have things that are uh, common in our restaurants closed, uh, and enforcement's going to become uh, paramount about that, whether it's playgrounds, whether it's the arcades within our facilities. And it, deviation from that enforcement, allowing customers to go ahead and do that, even if you have a sign up that says don't use this area, will spawn customer related litigation when they get COVID-19 and it's very difficult to go ahead and fight a uh, negligence cause of action or a negligence per se cause of action if we've deviated from some guidance, whether it be from OSHA, CDC, or your local jurisdiction. So make sure to pay attention to those. Andrea is covering a lot of those nitty gritty. I'm simply highlighting where we think that litigation is going to come from. Next slide, please. So we're still trying to make sure everybody understands we're open uh, and we're trying to do that in a safe way. The, the, the risk of the litigation is just absolutely paramount. And in the next slide, you'll see that there are some new rules out there uh, that are causing probably the biggest immediate spawn of litigation. It's the FFCRA, that Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, the entitlement to paid sick leave, the potential entitlement to emergency paid FMLA under limited circumstances are creating some retaliation claims. They're creating certainly some interference claims that are pop that are bubbling up and causing a lot of trouble. We're going to be talking about those also during the deep dive. Next slide. Wage and hour is the one that will come probably later, uh, and we'll see the areas again of temperature checks and remote access to timekeeping system and whether people need to be reimbursed for cell phone apps, or for hot schedules, or some other device that you use to track time and attendance. Those types of things are going to become wage and hour uh, compliance issues. We'll talk about some strategies to deal with it there. And then the next slide is just in closing, we're looking at this cycle of endlessly trying to plan and prepare, perform, ending up going ahead and evaluating things to try and always minimize that fifth R I originally talked about, that risk category. So I'm looking forward to talking about these topics with everybody else a little bit more tomorrow or, and, uh, and we'll talk soon, thank you. Thank you very much, Al. That was terrific information. I, uh, Taylor, if we don't already have a link to that uh, exceptional uh, opening protocol program he and his partners put together, let's be sure we put that on the blog so everybody can locate that. Alden, you, the risk is, is clearly out there when reopening insurance. Uh, if people are re uh, doing their insurance since the outbreak of the virus, I'm under the impression that all carriers are excluding coverage for COVID-19 cases. Uh -huh. And so that just increases the risk quite dramatically. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. And perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that during your deeper dive. But thank you very much. Excellent thank you. I'm happy to do it. Yep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this, this little nagging issue has been around a while uh, around uh, website litigation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
you know, the drive-by lawsuits uh, have kind of slowed down because people aren't staying at hotels. I think that's accurate. And uh, But Jordan has stayed busy uh, with uh, part of his practice focusing on these ADA uh, website uh, issue, compliance issues. So uh, we've asked Jordan to visit with you about that because it's still very much a challenge for us. Uh, Jordan Schwartz is a partner in the Labor and Employment Practice Group at Con Masiel. Uh, he's out of the Washington DC office. He defends employers in litigation at the federal and state levels. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear what Jordan has to tell us about these lawsuits around websites under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Jordan. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. And yeah, basically exactly what you said. Um, the actual physical ADA lawsuits where someone is going to the property for the purpose of potentially um, commencing an ADA lawsuit, you know, given that so many properties have been closed, that has slowed down. But the rest of the ADA website litigation um, really has not been affected by coronavirus. You know, unlike all the other uh, presentations you've heard today, th this has really been constant. It's been a, a um, thorn in, in the side of hotels for, for years that continues to uh, be such a thorn now, even with uh, properties being closed or starting to reopen because individuals can still go to the website's prop or go to the property's website and allege ADA non-compliance. Um, so I'm just gonna you know, talk for a few minutes about what, what that means. And um, just by real quick background, under the ADA and the, the public access portion of the ADA, which is Title III, um, you know, this applies to hotels, but, but uh, you know, let me clarify, it also uh, applies to restaurants, to spas, to, to resorts, to all places of public accommodations. Um, and it prohibits um, not only hotels, but all places of public accommodations from denying services and accommodations to individuals with disabilities. And as I'll talk about more in a minute, that's been interpreted to apply to websites. So um, as a, an owner or operator or manager of a place of public accommodation, you need to modify your policies, practices, and procedures with regards to your website and in other words, remove any barriers to access so that these websites are accessible for individuals with disabilities. And if you look at the next slide, you know, I'm gonna spend about three, three or four minutes on each two um, headers here. Number one is, does your website need to be accessible for users with visual, hearing, and physical impairments. So that's, uh, we're mainly talking about individuals who, who um, have difficulty seeing. Um, do you have to make your websites accessible for them? And then the second part is um, specifically for hotels, does your website need to provide information regarding accessible features at your hotel? And that's more for individuals with mobility impairments. Um, and that's more related to the drive-by lawsuits, but it is what is listed on your website. But moving, moving on to the next slide, as to this first component, yes, your website needs to be accessible um, for individuals who are blind. Um, for a little while, courts were ruling on both sides of the issue, so it was really complicated to determine what to do. But in the past couple of years, um, courts have been virtually unanimous um, in finding that places of websites are places of public accommodation and thus need to be accessible. Um, as a result, you need to make sure your website is accessible, is compliant with what's called the web, web uh, website compliant accessibility guidelines. And the latest standard is 2.1. And I'll talk to you more specifically in detail on Tuesday about what that means. But moving on to the next slide, um, you know, the, the, there has been a few cases over the last few years that have been super important. You know, one of them is um, in the Southern District of Florida where Winn-Dixie was found. Uh, their website needed to be accessible um, since it was related to and had a nexus to the actual um, grocery store 
But the latest case um, in, in the fall of 2019 was when the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, denied cert um, in the matter of Robles versus Domino's Pizza, which by doing so, the Supreme Court, in a way, um, all, you can say it agreed with the Ninth Circuit that held that Title III applies to websites. By not taking the case and not overruling it, the law of the land for the most part right now is that websites do need to be accessible um, with, as I said, the web uh, content accessibility guidelines and Title III as a whole. And I'll talk more specifically about this case um, on Tuesday. Uh, going to the next slide, um, what, what I mean by accessibility issues is, is in, uh, the following. You know, users with visual impairments likely will not be able to uh, use their screen reader software to ascertain um, menus that are listed on your site in PDF format. So if you have that, that's an issue. If you have pictures, symbols, maps, diagrams with no written descriptions, that's also an issue. Uh, text as an image file as opposed to HTML or links that just say click here um, are all issues. You know, video and audio files with no captioning and navigating a website without a mouse or a keyboard, also an issue. Um, and keep in mind that even if you get sued and you come up with a settlement agreement to fix these issues, but then you get sued by someone else, courts have found that your, the initial lawsuit doesn't preclude you um, from being sued a second time. Until these issues are actually fixed um, and compliant with the ADA, you will still be on the hook for any potential liability. Uh, moving on to the next slide, you know, what, what really you have to do, um, both when you get sued, but hopefully to be proactive and prior to getting sued, is retain an accessibility consultant that can help you build safeguards into your website to protect you um, against um, these types of lawsuits. And if you retain an accessibility consultant and you do it through legal counsel, it can be protected as work uh, product privilege, attorney-client privilege, and then it will not be discoverable when a potential plaintiff sues you. So that is very important. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, you really, there, there should be no reason that websites that are, are compliant with the ADA do not have an accessibility statement somewhere prominently displayed on your website that says, we take the ADA seriously, um, our website is ADA compliant, these are the steps we've undergone, something to that effect. You know, I, I can talk to you more specifically about what it actually should say, but that real accessibility statements have been found to really help, um, uh, help prevent these types of ADA uh, Title III website lawsuits. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, and this is, this is part two now of the, uh, of the information I wanted to provide that's limited to hotels. Um, and hotels, per the regulations of the ADA, need to provide for several things, including, number one here, that an individual with a disability must be able to make reservations for accessible guest rooms during the same hours and in the same manner as individuals who do not need accessible rooms. Thus, you cannot make someone call your property if people for an accessible room, if other people who want a non-accessible room are able to book that room on the website. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, you need to ensure that accessible guest rooms are held by individuals with the, uh, for individuals with disabilities until all other guest rooms have been rented. If someone just calls for your um, king, king room and you have a dozen king rooms, you do not, you're not permitted to give away the accessible king room. Uh, and let's say you have one accessible king room, you're not permitted to give that room away first unless it's specifically requested by an individual with a disability. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, you need to make sure that specific guest rooms um, are able to be reserved and are blocked from the system so that you don't get into the problem 
where someone who has reserved, let's say, a room with the roll and shower comes to your property and then you give them a room, a different accessible room without a roll and shower. These types of confusion, confusing type issues are where are the genesis of many lawsuits and that's why these regs provide these requirements. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, and this is the last feature, the, the last portion of the regs I wanna talk about and arguably the most important because it's the um, genesis for the most lawsuits is your property's website must identify and describe all of the accessible features in your hotel. Um, the reason is so someone with a physical mobility disability knows whether or not the hotel meets his or her needs. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so you need to provide information regarding both the common areas of your property. Do you have um, a ramp to get into the um, hotel? Is your front desk accessible? Um, are your public restrooms accessible? Are there routes to get to those areas? And as I think the next slide says, you also need to provide information about your accessible rooms. You know, do you have accessible rooms with a roll and shower? Do you have two uh, queen beds? Do you have one king bed? Things of that nature. You need to provide that information on your website. If you don't, this is an easy fix. You don't need a website consultant. You can work with um, someone like me and any ADA attorney who can just help you put this information in an easy, easy to read format on your website. Um, and let's see if there are any more slides. I believe that is it. This is our blog that always talks about these issues. I'll be happy to talk to you much more detail about these issues uh, on Tuesday. Jordan, thank you very much. Very helpful and great examples. Uh, very practical examples that people can walk away with understanding what their responsibilities are. I hope they take advantage of your blog and I'm sure they'll take advantage of a deeper conversation on this Tuesday. So thanks. Thank you very much, Jordan, as always. Very helpful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up our first round of our TED style talks. And we hope you enjoyed these. Each of these speakers were scheduled to take a deeper dive uh, when we get into our live format on Tuesday. Thanks for listening, and we'll look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.